live sir uh, dear pure urology facebook viewers good evening one and all uh, as you all know we are doing regular surgical technique based uh, urology presentations on and off today the topic is uh, rirs and uh, the speaker is my close friend ravi kumar ravi jain from the ahmedabad and he is very enthusiastic uh, among all the youngsters in india who is doing different types of endo urology work including uh, abnormal uh, cases of uh, pcnl as well as regular cases of rirs he is developing interest in endo urology and rirs uh, today we have chosen after a long time about the basics how to put up the table how to do the primary rirs in one more surgeon's perspective this is different uh, uh, perspectives will be there from different surgeons as the experience increases they will uh, tell their favorite points uh, how to do the rirs uh, can i share the presentation before i hand over the program i will introduce him morley thank you so pure urology session today next so video based surgical presentation on rirs how i do it dr ravi jain next he is visiting consultant robotic and renal transplant surgeon at euro health clinic sgvp holistic hospital aron hospital gcs medical college shelby hospital sham urology hospital and care and cure hospital his special interest are in advanced minimally invasive urology surgeries laser laparoscopy and robotics and urodynamics he is an expert in rirs retrograde intraoral surgery for kidney stones he has performed more than 2000 kidney stone surgeries more than 200 laparoscopic surgeries cancer surgeries and has been part of more than 130 kidney transplantation surgeries he got the vast experience of dealing with complex cases and performing various complex procedures during his tenure of assistant professor urology at the internationally acclaimed institute ikrdc civil hospital ahmedabad during the period of 2018 to 2021 he has been a faculty at various national and international conference for rirs and has demonstrated live rirs surgeries at workshops he is academically oriented as several research publication to his credit he is an author and a poet by position passion and writes several philosophical articles under the title spreading positivity and in fact he writes uh, rj shames is his caption we like it and he always shares some beautiful scenic uh, uh, pictures along with a good quotation and in below he writes rj shines rj rocks does stand up poetry and release several videos on youtube so with this presentation i like to uh, ask few questions uh, ravi jain you are mch uh, thank you first of all for accepting the invitation to give a talk on pure thank you sir it's my fortune to be part of pure yeah ravi jain you 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 did your mch from which place uh, sir i did my uh, dnb urology from pune uh, ruby hall clinic oh very good what about uh, uh, the ms sir mbbs and ms my schooling mbbs and ms have been from ahmedabad uh, vs hospital it's the second biggest uh, hospital after bj medical college and i did my uh, post graduation from here ahmedabad only very nice after the mch uh, where did i you, you where did you do your training post yes DNB? sir, sir uh, i worked with dr kandap parekh uh, my mentor for rirs uh, uh, for one year and then i was assistant professor at ikdrc for four years after that i have been into the private practice very good so in ikrdc what are the new things which you have learnt uh, which were not there in uh, bj sir main thing is the hands on training uh, the hands on training which uh, every resident and every faculty gets at ikdrc is uh, just superb uh, i have been uh, done more than 500 pcnls more than 400 rirs when i was uh, assistant professor for 3 years and every resident every uh, person over there has good hands on laparoscopy uh, especially the retrobotan laparoscopy and uh, so there is volume there is variety and uh, there is uh, excellent hands on Uh, what about uh, who are your mentors? Last question before I hand over the program. Who are your endo urology and urology mentors? You want to mention yes, the names? Uh, sir, my DNB mentors were uh, Dr. Shri Shyande and Dr. Rajendra Shimpi, uh, Dr. Kandap Parekh, uh, and uh, from IKDRC, Dr. Jamal Rizvi and Dr. Pranjul Modi, sir. Great. 
So with this, uh, I like to listen from you, the RIRS, how you do it, taking the uh, experience of these uh, five to 10 years. Over yes. to you, Pravijay. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Pure Urology. I will uh, straight away start with uh, my presentation. In any case of RIRS, I always uh, keep a cystoscope. Uh, ureteroscope and a flexible ureteroscope ready. The ureteroscope at the present case is a 6, 7.5 French URS. Uh, if you have a 4.5 French URS in your armamentarium, it is an asset to your armamentarium. And uh, in the flexible ureteroscope, depending on the case and depending on the availability, I keep uh, the disposable or the limited use uh, ureteroscope or uh, the Flex X2, which uh, is the most versatile uh, ureteroscope to my mind. Uh, I would like to describe the trolley uh, which I prepare for my RIRS setup. Usually I keep all the disposables on one trolley uh, where I would like to describe uh, you should have a variety of disposables available because any case uh, may require different set of disposables. So routinely we start with the guide wire. My choice is a Terumo glide wire uh, although if you have a sensor guide wire or a bi wire which is available then it can be very useful. So we usually uh, need a guide wire in the first setting. Then we require uh, we may require a uretic balloon dilator. Uh, uretic balloon dilator is especially helpful in uh, patients who are unstinted and even in stented patients we may require a uretic balloon dilator. The next thing that is most important uh, in the uh, armamentarium is the uretic excess sheet. Uh, uretic excess sheet helps decrease the intrapelvic pressure, it helps reduce the rate of urosepsis. So I always uh, have a uretic excess sheet and you should know which flexible scope you are using and the scope will accommodate in which size of the excess sheet. So if you are using a Flex X 2S by the Carl Stores, it can go easily in a 9.5 by 11.5 French excess sheet. Uh, 10 by 12 French excess sheet has been said to have the lowest intrapelvic pressure. If you are using the newer version of the limited use digital ureteroscopes, then it cannot accommodate within the 9.5, 11.5 excess sheet. So in that case, you need to use a 10 by 12 French excess sheet. Also very important to learn is the size of the excess sheet. So I always have a 35 centimeter uh, uretic excess sheet which is uh, to my mind uh, very useful in uh, most of our patients, especially female patients and especially short stretcher patients. Uh, also uh, this is the 10 by 12 French uretic excess sheet. So this is of a 35 centimeter and the other one is of a 45 centimeter which might be useful in uh, tall stretcher patients. Uh, then uh, you need the laser machine, the laser fiber, uh, usually we use a 200 micron laser fiber, uh, 272 micron laser fiber is also very useful and uh, to my mind uh, a 200 micron fiber is little more fragile. Uh, also along with that we need uh, the uretric, uh, the, sorry, the uh, baskets uh, which are of different types, uh, it can be the encircle or the engage or the jipaw depending on the company but ultimately we should have uh, two set of uh, different baskets uh, which can be a tipless basket and something like a engage or a jipaw type of a basket which can be useful. Uh, one important thing uh, if we have uh, is the double lumen ureteric catheter. Uh, at present I do not have the double lumen ureteric catheter. But uh, it is a 10 uh, French double lumen ureteric catheter which comes and especially in patients who are uh, having very tight ureters and uh, it helps in passive dilatation of the ureter uh, number one. Number two it helps in doing an RGP and it is also helpful in uh, passing uh, in doing a contrast study. So if a double lumen ureteric catheter can be life saving in few of the selected cases. So I usually keep all these disposables ready. Uh, I open it only when required. Um, most of them are, uh, all of them in fact are pre-sterilized with the ETO or by the plasma sterilization. Uh, I would also like to show you the uh, OT setup where uh, the patient is uh, painted and draped in the lithotomy position and uh, the, C uh, the uh, lap tower or the monitor is uh, facing on my left side. And the laser machine, the laser machine is on the right side of my uh, setup where I can uh, uh, take the laser fiber and keep it under my control. The IITV is uh, placed on the right side depending on your OT setup, uh, it can be on the left or the right side. But whatever important th uh, message is that your OT should be spacious and you need to use your space efficiently and effectively because uh, many of the times we have congested and clumsy spaces, some wire is falling on the other and if such is the case then the whole procedure gets a little 
difficult. So let's now start the case and uh, I will uh, keep talking to you about uh, the various steps of the surgery. Uh, this patient which I am going to perform is a patient of 110 kilos, a morbidly obese patient. Patient presented to us with an 18 millimeter left sided solitary functioning kidney with a solitary functioning kidney with a 18 millimeter impacted PUG stone. Patient had creatinine of 5 counts of 20,000. So as uh, we all uh, pr follow, uh, I had to pre stain this patient and now after the resolution of sepsis, I am going to uh, go for a stented uh, uh, RIRS in this patient. So uh, I have uh, removed the uh, DJ strain and now I am going to place uh, the uh, excess sheet over the guide wire. In this patient I am planning to use the disposable uh, urotroscope hence I have taken a 10 by 12 French urotic excess sheet. Uh, if my 10 by 12 French excess sheet doesn't go then I also have a 9.5 by 11.5 French excess sheet. Uh, one important uh, finding uh, as I discussed is the length of the urotroscope uh, of the excess sheet. So in this case uh, many of the times just as uh, it happened in my case uh, after uh, the excess sheet has been pre-sterilized with the ETO and sometimes uh, there can be a mistake uh, where your assistant can uh, put your excess sheet with a wrong label. So you are confused what is the length of the uretic excess sheet. So uh, I want a 35 centimeter or 38 centimeter excess sheet in this patient of uh, length because my patient is not very tall and uh, in uh, tall in the height. So, uh, I want a 35 or a 38 centimeter excess sheet. A very simple uh, trick which I follow is uh, when I uh, use or measure the excess sheet with my palm and if it is of uh, around uh, 2 uh, palm breadths, uh, then I assume that this is a 35 or a 38 centimeter excess sheet. Whereas, uh, for a 45 centimeter excess sheet, the excess sheet will be longer. Of course, you can use a ruler or a scale, but this is a very simple trick I always follow. The second important step which I follow is the lubrication of the excess sheet. Of course, a newly opened uretic excess sheet uh, usually walks inside very easily, but uh, any excess sheet has to be adequately lubricated. And I just use the simple maneuver of uh, dipping uh, a saline gauze piece and uh, lubricating the inner and outer uh, surface of the excess sheet. I just gently rub it with the uh, saline gauze piece and you don't have to manually rub or uh, otherwise the lubrication will actually go away but this is just a simple way you can use a syringe as well but this is this is the way i have been watching and i've been following so now my excess sheet has been lubricated uh, a very important step or a very common mistake which uh, many of the youngsters or many of the people in their initial learning curve do when you lock the uretic excess sheet sometimes you don't know uh, accidentally the excess sheet can just get unlocked over here and you see uh, so the excess sheet the tip of the excess sheet is not not very pointed because and it can happen that while you are passing the excess sheet this can actually get unlocked and uh, your excess sheet is not passing so if you have difficulty in passing the excess sheet always confirm that your excess sheet is adequately locked different uh, companies have got different menu makes of the locking system cook uh, indovasive and uh, blue name etc but you should be just aware that your excess sheet is properly locked now I am just lubricating it gently and I will pass it over the uh, guide wire under fluoroscopic guidance if required. Okay. So while passing the excess sheet, uh, just make it sure that uh, like in any endoscopic procedure, we hold the penis uh, tight and uh, straight and uh, the excess sheet while uh, passing, I am just gently uh, passing it on the uh, glide wire. As this is a stented patient, I expect that the excess sheet should ideally cross in easily. But anytime you have any undue resistance, uh, please make sure that you don't force it prop force it, and excess sheet should actually walk in easily. Now you can see the excess sheet is walked in easily. I will confirm it on the CRM. So now as you can see uh, my 38 centimeter uretic excess sheet has fallen short in this case. Uh, the excess sheet has just crossed uh, the uh, sacroiliac joint and it is at the level of uh, the upper ureter but uh, still it should be at the level of L3 vertebra. So in this case I would prefer to use a uh, excess sheet uh, which uh, goes up to the level of PUJ uh, but it all depends on the case how we go. I would like to describe the movements of the flexible scope. Uh, so there are practically basically six main movements. Uh, I would like to describe uh, this is uh, down and this is up. So basically this is an intuitive scope where uh, it is following me the directions. So where I am moving the lever down, the scope is moving down and when I am moving the lever up, the scope is moving up. 
so this is the up and down movement second is the uh, to and fro movement so uh, the scope can move ahead and the scope can move uh, backwards so whenever i am holding the scope uh, within the excess sheet i am holding the scope uh, gently between my index finger and the thumb and i can advance the scope uh, within the excess sheet or i can pull back the scope within the excess sheet so that is the to and fro movement of the uh, scope uh, the third, uh, the uh, fifth and the sixth movement will be the left and the right movement. So when I'm uh, moving this, uh, I need to move the scope at, with my wrist joint. So uh, there are different ways of moving the scope within the kidney. And what I believe or what is my technique that uh, with, whenever I want to go into the left kidney of the patient, I believe that uh, my wrist joint should move towards my left. So this is something when I'm moving uh, the wrist joint towards the left, you can see that the scope is also turning towards the left side. And similarly, when I want to move into the right kidney of the patient, I will move the scope at my wrist joint on my right side so that you can see that the scope is now turning on the right side. So suppose if uh, I'm holding it straight, uh, this is the, I'm holding it this way. And if I want to enter into the right side kidney of the patient and I want to, I will move my scope towards the right side. So this is facing towards the right upper calyx. Uh, I will gently press it down and I will enter the middle calyx and this you can see uh, this is the right uh, lower calyx and especially if I want to enter into the right lower anterior calyx I will have to move the <coughs> scope even more and at this juncture when uh, suppose the calyx is facing at 7 o'clock of the clock then I can move uh, you can see I am twisting the movement uh, the neck of the uh, scope uh, with my thumb and the index finger and I can still enter into the lower anterior calyx which to my mind is the most difficult calyx. So again uh, I am uh, making it straight. So again suppose I want to enter into the left kidney of the patient I will move my wrist joint towards my right and so you can see this is the left upper calyx now the scope is facing towards the middle calyx and this is the lower uh, calyx on the left side and again if i want to enter into the left lower anterior calyx i will have to move more and i will have to twist the scope with my finger and uh, thumb and i can enter into the lower anterior calyx and uh, another movement which is uh, which obviously is the passive deflection of the scope which occurs at the level of the pelvis that the scope uh, starts taking a gentle bend when it crosses the pelvis and you can take the advantage of the scope so uh, to hold the scope comfortably within uh, in this fashion and uh, i believe that uh, patients left my left patients right my right this is what is uh, i say it is my technique so now uh, in this case I am using the limited use uh, digital urotoscope. Uh, this one is by the BioRad. Uh, a few uh, points I always uh, like to consider before using any urotoscope. We should always confirm which urotic excess sheet which uh, will it be accommodating. Second important thing is that uh, we should always uh, know uh, it, whether it is a counter intuitive or an intuitive mechanism. Uh, intuitive means up goes up and down goes down. So when I am pressing the lever down as you can see the urotoscope is uh, the tip is getting deflected downwards and when I am pressing it up it is going upwards. Uh, very important uh, is that uh, because uh, if you are used to an intuitive mechanism and if you suddenly get an counter intuitive mechanism your movements get reciprocated and uh, it might be little difficult and you might take some time uh, to adjust to that new mechanism and if you are a learner then definitely it uh, becomes a little difficult I've been used to the intuitive mechanism and uh, so I always check with that uh, this is the digital urotoscope so uh, it's very light in weight and I'm holding it very comfortably another important thing is that uh, you can uh, I'm just holding the urotoscope comfortably uh, like this uh, the most important you should always support the head of the any instrument any uh, scope you should always there are people who will uh, just hold it uh, this way or this way and so you can easily bend it important thing is that it should not be acutely bent you can just hold it uh, comfortably within a u shape uh, there are two most important uh, weak points of the rotoscope one is the uh, neck of the uh, shaft where the deflection mechanism is there and second is the mechanism where here uh, as you can see where the head and the shaft of the urotoscope is attached so other than that you can comfortably i'm not bending it very much i'm not bending it here i'm just holding it comfortably and you can easily uh, take the urotoscope this way uh, now i would like to describe uh, 
the irrigation mechanism which I use in my cases. Uh, this is the to his adapter. Uh, it's uh, sometimes there can be a three-way mechanism uh, attached to it. Uh, this is a to his adapter. So the irrigation mechanism uh, uh, I will be using is a hundred centimeter extension tube which will go from here and any accessory like the laser fiber or basket or uh, any other thing which I need uh, will pass from here. As you can see my assistant is uh, take, has taken a hundred centimeter uh, extension tube and this is attached to the to his adapter and he will just gently push in uh, as much irrigation is required I do not prefer any of the pressurized irrigation systems so now I am passing the excess sheet uh, in uh, the urotoscope in the excess sheet and as you can see I am holding the urotic excess sheet uh, in my index and middle finger and I am passing the uh, flag, uh, urotoscope with the help of my thumb and uh, the little finger I am just gently uh, passing it inside uh, as this is already in the excess sheet I am I can just pass it uh, easily and I'm just passing the excess sheath inside and uh, now I am at the uh, upper ureter. So this which I was talking about in the upper ureter, sometimes it can be a little difficult to negotiate the upper ureter uh, without a guide wire. So as you can see now I'm uh, in the excess sheath. Uh, so here I can just withdraw the excess sheath a little bit and I can, I'm just deflecting it down. I am deflecting it down. And now uh, it is just like driving a car where you can uh, ease the pani nako where I can, uh, I'm just ne negotiating and see, now I'm at the uh, level of the PUJ. So here uh, is the PUJ, it's a golden stone, it's a Hounsfield unit is uh, less than 1000 and now I can appreciate the uh, stone over here. Okay. So as you can see, I have passed the uh, 200 micron fiber. Uh, the laser we are using is the uh, 35 watt uh, thulium fiber laser by the IPG and I'm using a 200 micron fiber. And as you can see, uh, I have uh, passed the guide, uh, the laser fiber uh, through the two his adapter and I have adequately locked the two his adapter so that there is no fluid uh, so that there is no much of uh, fluid written outside. At the same time, you keep uh, uh, watching that the excess sheath is draining adequate of uh, water so that uh, your pr intrapelvic pressures are always on the lower side. Now, as uh, you can see, I have uh, kept uh, started uh, as this is a soft stone. I have started on the dusting mode. I have started with the energy of 0.6 joules and uh, the frequency I have kept it as 10 hertz, which we may change during the OT. Also, a very important is uh, a very simple uh, trick, but I always uh, prefer to keep a cloth below where I stand and I always uh, keep the laser paddle on the right side. I am a right side handed surgeon and I always prefer to uh, use the paddle on the right side. There are people who always uh, fumble uh, where is after you have passed the fiber, after you pass the flexible scope or oh, where is the laser paddle and where is the pneumatic paddle which you use in URS. So I always make it sure that all the things are adequately and pre uh, properly placed before I start my actual procedure because then sometimes you can uh, pull out something or you can injure your scope or you can uh, damage something. So uh, as you can see uh, another important thing is that we should always take care that the scope is not acutely bent as you can see it's comfortable it's not very much bent over here and during the operative procedure also you should keep checking the scope position because uh, though these are the disposable or the uh, limited use scopes but if you are using uh, flex x2 or flex xc or uh, any of the scope uh, you should be very careful about the wear and tear of your instrument. Uh, as it, you can see in this case I have started dusting I always prefer to dust any stone as this is the PUJ stone uh, I'm just started dusting the stone uh, from the periphery I don't need to basket it and keep it at another suitable location uh, we have started uh, the dusting I always note the time when I've started the dusting so that at the end we always uh, take uh, into account so now as you can see in this procedure, uh, I am gently putting irrigation, uh, my assistant is doing a fantastic job, he knows exactly when to uh, put the saline and when he needs to uh, rest and uh, as in this case I have started with, uh, I started with 0.6 joules. So now I am uh, I've kept it at 0.8 joules and 15 hertz and uh, this is a relatively soft stone, I have just uh, started uh, dusting, I am dusting it from the periphery. Uh, PCNL surgeons always have the habit of uh, breaking the stone into big fragments and removing the pieces and we all uh, get fantasized uh, when we finish the procedure early and people who take a lot of time, uh, especially in RIR as initially they feel oh, it's taking a lot of time. But believe me, uh, whatever time uh, if you fragment then you have to keep removing all the fragments uh, and you the, at the end. Uh, the time taken for dusting versus uh, fragmentation and removing the stones comes down to the similar and I'm sure uh, I will be able to dust this stone within uh, 15 minutes and the procedure should not take more than half an hour in total. 
I'm just giving, I'm just dusting the stone from uh, different quadrants, different, uh, I'm just trying to shell out the stone into very fine dust. Uh, very gentle irrigation is going on and uh, right now I'm not uh, very much worried if the stone slips into the lower calyx, yes, but uh, it's also uh, wise if you can uh, move the stone. And I'm, uh, as I'm uh, moving the scope, I also move the scope with my, uh, there are uh, different movements of the urotoscope. Uh, one of the very helpful maneuvers is also the finger in, finger out uh, movement, when the scope can move in and move out with your index finger and the thumb. And uh, I'm just barely touching the stone. There are different uh, views on this, whether we should touch the stone, we should, whether we should be uh, a little away from the uh, stone, because uh, that should create a plasma bubble or a vapor bubble, and it should be able to fragment. Uh, uh, the TFL is new into the market, and there is a lot of uh, studies being going on different settings and uh, on the mechanics of the laser. But uh, I just apply the principles what I have learned for the Holmium Yag laser. Uh, definitely, I, they may be, uh, they make it change with the growing experience. So in this case, uh, I have uh, now completely dusted the stone. I initially started with the uh, settings of 0.6 joules and uh, 10 hertz frequency uh, on the dusting mode. I increased the settings to 1 joule and 10 hertz, but realizing that this was a harder stone uh, is uh, contradictory to my expectation. I uh, switched to the fragmentation mode of the thulium fiber laser. The settings were the same 1 joule and 10 hertz. Uh, I have appreciated a difference in the dusting, uh, though the settings will be the same on the dusting versus is fragmentation mode probably the pulse duration comes into picture over here as you can appreciate after complete dusting i am checking each and every calyx to confirm that fine golden dust is made at the end of the procedure and i also do an rgb at the end of every procedure to confirm there is no contrast extravasation or any injury thank you that is a very excellent demonstration ravi thank you sir that is excellent demonstration. You have recorded well and you have shown very well. Uh, Thank you, only thing is that which size of the guideware you use, Palani Narayan has asked. Normally, Termo guideware uh, for access sheet threading, what size you will use? Uh, sir, guide wire is a 0.035 inch guide wire, Terumuk guide wire or a sensor guide wire and excess sheet uh, usually a 10 by 12 French erotic excess sheet or a 9.5 by 11.5 French excess sheet. Okay. Double lumen uretic catheter, when will you use normally? Uh, normally it is not used. When will you use double lumen uretic catheter? Sir, especially sometimes uh, when the ureter is tight and my flexible scope is not going. Uh, in that cases, I found that the double lumen uretic catheter helps in dilating the ureter and it helps in passing a safety guide wire. It helps in doing an RGB. And many of the cases where we felt that, oh, the ureter is tight and we might have to abandon, the double lumen uretic catheter has been helpful in that case. Okay. Yes. Now, you wanted to continue? Yes, sir. So, I will uh, uh, share another presentation. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, thank you, uh, Chandramohan, sir, and uh, Pure Urology for giving this opportunity. And uh, I believe that teaching is not just a profession, it is the noblest passion. And uh, a good teacher is the one who teaches what to do, but the best teacher is the one who teaches what not to do. So my mentors have been uh, Dr. Kandap Parikh, and uh, I've been fortunate enough to have uh, been uh, attached with uh, Dr. Oliver Traxer and my training at IKDRC has uh, given me the whole hands-on experience. Uh, Pre-operative workup, we all know I will not be getting into much detail. Urine culture is essential and uh, case selection is okay. Informed consent, that is what I believe is very, very important. And uh, uh, I always uh, have... Uh, uh, special consent uh, for RIRS, which is in the vernacular language that is in Gujarati, in which uh, I will, uh, in which uh, I will uh, discuss all the pros and cons of the procedure, especially all the options of ESWL, PCNL, mini PCNL are explained. Pa uh, patient is explained about the uh, necessity of pre-stenting, although I uh, do not pre-stent routinely, and uh, my pre-stenting rate usually comes on to around 10 uh, percentage, where uh, cases of uh, tight ureters or maybe patients with sepsis, I have had to pre-stent. Always explain about the necessity of uh, repeat procedure. 
post operative complications i uh, usually explain them uh, if uh, so whatever uh, uh, complications or whatever thing is expected out of rir is always take a proper consent with the patient ot checklist i have already described uh, so this is the ot checklist i you should also have the radio pec uh, contrast and the radio protective lead appearance and the lead uh, thyroid shield uh, semi rigid uteroscopy is one thing where uh, patients where uh, there is a, a debate uh, so i do semi rigid uteroscopy in all the cases even if they are pre stented uh, because it helps me uh, and especially if it is an unstented patient uh, it helps me in studying the uretic orifice uh, whether the orifice requires balloon dilatation to study the caliber of the ureter uh, because it helps me know how tight the ureter is any uretic stone which has come down in the ureter can be dealt with the flex uh, semi rigid uteroscopy and uh, it also helps in passive dilatation and chance finding of a tcc ureter can be diagnosed with the help of semi rigid uteroscopy so this is what uh, we always do in our uh, procedures uretic excess sheet there is always a debate uh, debate is on whether we should use it whether uh, which size we should use it uh, how to insert the excess sheet and what are the advantages and the disadvantages yes uh, uretic excess sheet i prefer to use and i believe and i have enough of literature evidence which lets me know that it helps reduce the intra pelvic pressure uh, by which uh, there are decreased chances of urosepsis and there is ease in removing the stone fragments uh, it doesn't brush the uretic mucosa and uh, also it uh, helps reduce the wear and tear of flexible scope and uh, the literature says that 10 by 12 french uretic excess sheet the produces the lowest intra pelvic pressure and uh, 35 cm or 28 cm excess sheet is preferable outer tip should be snugly at the meatus as you also saw in the case the tip was at the meatus so if it's a ectopic kidney maybe you need to use a smaller excess sheet so ultimately if your excess sheet is hanging more outside you may have difficulty inner tip should be 3 to 4 cm below the upj and very important is always watch for the fluid return so that lower intra pelvic pressures are maintain rgp uh, i do not do rgp uh, in all the cases initially but uh, especially in cases with difficult anatomy uh, ckd patients where i couldn't do an ct ivp cases with calicial diverticulum block calyx and other uh, difficult procedures but yes i always do at the end of the procedure uh, which helps me know about any contrast extravasation and any injury uh, i would like to show one of the cases Hello friends today i'm going to present an interesting case of sheathless rirs in an unstented patient with upper ureteric kink done with tfl laser the patient is a 65 year female present with left flank pain a puget stone of 11 mm and upper calyx of 5 mm stone the patient was afebrile rft was normal the patient had some urine infection but the culture was sterile The patient was given antibiotics for 5 days and she was planned for left RIRS. The NCCT KOB shows the very hard stone of 1700 ounce per unit at the POJ and in upper calyx stone of 5 mm and hydronephrosis is appreciable. I always begin my RIRS with a semi rigid ureteroscopy and as expected in this case of unstented patient the lower ureter was narrow. So the first challenge in this case was a narrow lower ureter URS 6 French not able to pass hence I did a balloon dilatation I always prefer a balloon dilatation over the serial ureteric dilators Balloon dilatation is appreciable in this picture I do not use any contrast because after the use of contrast the balloon doesn't be fit for reuse The balloon dilatation is done under cystoscopic and CM guidance. The balloon is kept inflated for around 2 to 3 minutes. After the use of balloon, I get a very good concentric dilatation of the ureter and my semi rigid ureteroscope is able to cross up to the upper ureter. The second challenge was putting an excess sheet of 9.5 11.5 French The uretic excess sheet was not able to cross the up lower ureter and after much jugglery I decided to go for a sheathless flexible ureteroscopy with FlexX 2S In this case the guide wire was obstructing the irrigation hence I had to remove the guide wire the flexible ureteroscope was able to cross up to the upper ureter but the another challenge appeared and the flexible ureteroscope could not negotiate the upper ureter beyond a certain level
Hence, I did an RGP and it showed me an upper ureteric kink. As we can see in the video, the upper ureteric kink is visible and I had to negotiate the upper ureteric kink with the help of a glide wire, Terumo glide wire. And mind you friends, this was the most difficult part of the surgery, negotiating the kink and sometimes it can be really damaging to your scope, especially if it is not the disposable one. Once I was into the system, I started begin to laser the heart PUG stone with the thulium fiber laser. I always prefer dusting over the fragmentation using very high energy settings in the form of high frequency and low energy. Excellent dusting is done with the help of TFL laser. I always take care of the irrigation. I do not use any of the pressurized irrigation. I use it helps in decreasing the chances of urosepsis. After doing the PUG stone, I went to the upper calyx and dusted the upper calyx stone, taking care that I do not perforate the system. Once I am done with the laser dusting, I always do an RGP, confirm that there is no extravasation of the contrast and I go into each of the calyces to confirm a complete clearance. Fine golden dust is appreciable at the end of the procedure which gives me a surety about my clearance on table. The post-operative outcome was uneventful, complete clearance was the patient was able to discharge within 48 hours with an added intravenous antibiotic for next day. No urosepsis was recorded. Friends, to conclude, RIR is as difficult in unstinted patients. Pre-stinting is ideal, but sheathless RIRs can be done, especially in female patients with FlexX2S. Balloon dilatation is helpful. RGP is advisable and upper uterus kings can definitely be challenging. Thank you. So, sir, uh, this was about... Uh, uh, question, sir. Gaurav Karla is very active member of the urolithiasis. Yes, sir. Uh, he asked two questions. Yes, sir. sir. RIR is digestion removal. Will you do again check your RSL uh, to see any residual fragments? Uh, no, sir. Uh, I usually uh, advise the, uh, like after one, uh, we have an intraoperative idea whether we have uh, given a complete clearance and uh, usually I will uh, get a NCCT or an ultrasound done at the end of one month. And uh, if it is showing me clearance, I usually remove stent under local anesthesia. Do you, do you pre-stent uh, uh, duration? If at all you pre-stent, what is the duration you stent uh, in our sir, Two weeks is an ideal duration. I have uh, encountered cases, uh, especially for ectopic kidney patients, where uh, after pre-stenting of one week, I have uh, gone uh, for the flexible ureteroscopy. I found that uh, that is an inadequate dilatation. So if the ureter was tight, uh, keep the stent for two weeks. That is an ideal period. Okay. Yes, sir. I would like to share some uh, challenging cases in RIRS, uh, which I have been, uh, uh, once again, sorry. Okay. So, uh, yes, sir. So uh, this was uh, a patient where uh, we had, uh, this was one of the most uh, difficult patients, which I have done. Uh, the patient had a right the patient had a right solitary functioning kidney. Uh, the patient presented to us with a stone burden of almost close to three centimeter and patient presented with raised creatinine and, and sepsis. So we could only get a plain CT done and the patient had a history of cox. So he had a right solitary lung. Uh, his left lung was completely uh, uh, white lung. So as you can anticipate doing a PCNL in this case, especially for an upper calyx puncture will be very, very tricky. We went in with the consent that we may require a, a staged procedure. And uh, when I was doing the flexible retroscopy, I could uh, lace the upper calyx stone, but I couldn't find the lower calyx stone. And then to my surprise, I did an RGP and found that the patient had a duplex moiety which was missed on the plain city, obviously. And uh, after doing an RGP, I went into the other moiety, completely laced the stones and uh, the whole procedure, we could get a complete clearance within 1.5 hours and uh, uh, we could uh, do the case completely. And the difficult part here was putting two DJs uh, in one go because that was a jugglery. One DJ walks in, the second DJ uh, comes out. So that was the whole funny part of that case. Uh, another case of, uh, again, a CKD patient uh, 
stone shown in the NCCT KUB. Uh, I'm not able to locate the stone, did an RGP, and I could find uh, that this is an upper calyx diverticulum. And uh, with the help of the flexible utroscopy, I could reach up to the upper calyx diverticulum. This is again a very difficult case for a PCNL or a mini perk because it's a very medial facing upper calyx. And I always keep this uh, picture of the flexible utroscope, uh, the Carl Stores Flex X2, uh, which uh, used to be there uh, in IKDRC for our training. And uh, all the residents and the uh, APs and other uh, faculties used to perform. But despite uh, this much of honeycombing and uh, difficulty, we used to do these cases. Another case of an upper calyx diverticulum, again, a patient has a malrotated kidney. And uh, uh, here we can appreciate a block calyx, uh, which is appreciable on RGP. And uh, uh, that was left and the diverticular case was done. Uh, another case of a lower calyx diverticulum, again, uh, not identified because plain city was done and do an RGP whenever you have in doubt and uh, you can uh, identify the diverticular stone. And uh, another case of a pelvic ectopic kidney, here the patient has got a bifid system, uh, bifid pelvis and uh, after pre-standing, I uh, could go into the bifid system and could completely dust the stone. Uh, this is a very interesting patient where a patient had undergone a renal transplant, live donor transplant, and a patient uh, after some uh, months presented with raised creatinine. Patient with a history of BK polyoma virus nephropathy. So, uh, uretic stricture was expected, and uh, we put a nephrostomy. And uh, later, when the creatinine stabilized, we went for an anti grade flexible urotoscopy. A tip here would be that uh, you should place the nephrostomy in an upper calyx so that uh, your angle uh, of the flexible scope is relatively straight into the ureter. Uh, so these are about uh, the uh, few of the uh, challenging cases uh, uh, we have done and uh, complications in RIRS, if so permits, I would uh, like to continue for that. Yeah, another five minutes for you. Okay, sir. So complications and RRs, I've been lucky that I have not got the erotic injury, but I had a few cases of uh, perinephric hematoma and psoas collection. So the tip here and a broken laser fiber, which actually occurred uh, during one of the live conferences. So the uh, tip here would be like, especially to avoid hematuria, you should be gentle in whatever instrument you are moving in, moving out, uh, a slow irrigation, an RGP at the end of the procedure. And whenever there is a refractory hematuria, just stand and stage the procedure. And irrigation mechanisms, as I've shown, uh, be very gentle. I usually prefer the 20 cc syringe and keep a note on the amount of fluid operative duration and uh, keep a note on the vitals, especially if you're suspecting a perinephric hematoma. Uh, we have a paper on uh, urosepsis and we believe that uh, uh, along with the negative urine culture, uh, excess sheath, plasma sterilization definitely helps in uh, reducing the uh, SIRS incidences. And uh, an interesting paper, which I have uh, come up with an observation is a stone analysis. So stone analysis, we usually get it done. And if we find that we have had a carbonate appetite content in the stone, it is an infection stone and uh, these patients can develop uh, SIRS. So if you have a carbonate appetite in your content, which is more than 50 percentage, be a uh, little uh, uh, more on the upgrading of the antibiotics. Uh, take home message should be uh, be gentle in whatever you introduce, whether it be a guide bar, excess sheet or the scope. Be slow and gradual what moves within the PCS, whether it's the irrigation or the laser. Uh, what comes out of the PCS, whether it's the irrigation or the RGP. And uh, training and learning uh, has no other alternative and urine culture, stone analysis and sterilization are important. Okay. I will skip this video. And uh, uh, last, uh, sir, uh, uh, this yeah. is a... Yes, sir. Yeah, please, please. Yes, sir. Uh, we, can we go for questions? Yes, sir. Thank you. So we'll quick go questions in the ten next uh, five minutes. Yes, and sir. And then conclude the session. Yes, sir. Number one, uh, Yati Srinivas has asked, uh, fever after RIRS, how often you encounter? These are the common questions uh, uh, asked by many people. You please give your experience how to avoid fever, sepsis. See, all fevers may not be Frank sepsis. In children, I have seen fever may be part and parcel of the endourology procedure. After one, and one or two days, it will come down. But in adults, high grade fever with chills and rigors, you are already worried for the sepsis because of previous infection, stent contamination, or urine culture positivity, or long duration of time. What is your take home message for the fever and how to avoid fever? Sir, slow and gentle irrigation, uh, maintaining the lower intrapelvic pressure and sterilization of your uh, instrument. These are the two most important uh, things which can decrease your SIRS uh, rate. Okay. Second question, uh, what is your antibiotic policy? 
sir antibiotic uh, usually we pre operatively we uh, start with the injection uh, cefepirazone sulbactam or uh, the third generation cefalosporin and uh, usually we give it on uh, the next day morning when we discharge the patient and uh, post operatively uh, maybe a levofloxacin 500 mg uh, once a day for 5 days that should be enough very good then uh, again he asked yatish uh, where are, what are the stone size you prefer to do in rirs maximum size and comfortable size what are comfortable size and maximum size so maximum size i have recently done up to 3 cm uh, and that was in the live operative workshop uh, i still am uh, skeptical about such high volume stones being done by rrs but tfl has definitely opened up new uh, has uh, expanded our thresholds believe uh, 1.5 to 2 cm stone should be a good enough uh, stone for rrs okay another question from uh, ujwal kumar how do we anticipate appetite stone during or just after surgery to predict sepsis when we don't have the analysis report any clinical look what do you mean to ask it's no sir difficult. i mean uh, it's uh, something similar to a matrix stone but you can't really predict yes, there is some of amount of muck which is there in the kidney and uh, some amount of uh, in you feel like uh, though it may not be the true true white stone of the matrix stone but there is some amount of muck which is there and stone analysis uh, advantage is that you can get it within one day uh you don't need to wait for the culture or stone culture or something so carbonate appetite uh, on uh, stone analysis has a very important predictive value how are you ravi gaur has asked me is the every time ncct needed post rirs before centrimol or x-ray kup in first of all do you require any if you have done single stone if you have done uh, ct based stone volume properly do you think x-ray kup and ct scan are routinely advised uh sir uh, it is for my uh, uh, satisfaction that yes i have done a complete job and uh, i am not leaving any stone fragment uh, intraoperatively is uh, more important we have a feel that uh, yes i have done a complete job and uh, just uh, because i remove the st uh, stents under local anesthesia so if the stent is migrated uh, maybe uh, uh, if the patient may require uh, just a uh, amount of sedation because usually i will be removing uh, the uh, stent with the semi rigid otoscopy only but that is a, only a cystoscope so yes i do a x-ray kub pre uh, post operatively very good so the, the, that is a question sir i will ask a few questions uh, what is the uh, role of rirs in uh, small stones who come uh, with symptoms 5 to 7 mm nowadays they are very common to see we try to avoid the surgery but they have back pain Uh, do you want to postpone so that they will grow or you remove them uh, especially when they are traveling abroad what is your point yes sir uh, these patients frequently come especially who are uh, traveling abroad or who are uh, the merchant navy or uh, some students so uh, i feel rirs has a role in that uh, those selected patients because you can't do a pcnl you can't do a uh, eswl multiple stones uh, we should try to get a stone analysis in these patients uh, especially and uh, if they are symptomatic yes we should operate them then uh, prashant patania has asked do you always able to clear all stones in inferior calyx especially due to acute angle how do you address inferior calicial stones yes sir uh, especially the lower anterior calyx stones are the difficult stones and uh, uh, the trick uh, the yes lower calyx stones have got a lower uh, clearance rates that is the worldwide uh, data so if it is a very hard stone try to fragment it and uh, move the stones into the upper calyx or the middle calyx and if uh, there is not much of an angle then i do not really bother to basket the stone into the calyx if it's an comfortable angle uh, i uh, dust the stone over there chalo sure. and uh, last question how many cases uh, a junior should do uh, along with mentor uh, um, to so that he can go to the surgery and do in his private practice for example if you join fellowship or if you join anything how many cases either seeing or doing will be sufficient to go for the rirs sir so i uh, assisted at least 50 cases uh, before i uh, i put excess sheet on 50 cases and then i started getting the flexible scope because that was a flex x2 or flex x3 now with the uh, newer scopes that uh, so at least 15 to 20 cases uh, should uh, or a uh, 25 to 30 cases uh, you should feel comfortable while uh, you can operate on a patient and nowadays we have got more of uh, simulation program so that is again uh, very very helpful Do you think that RIRS uh, simulation programs are useful? 
Yes, sir. Because um, um, even my colleagues uh, who used to uh, have, they have confusion. Uh, they don't know which colleagues they are moving in. Uh, they had to do an RGP during the procedure. And uh, then uh, uh, to get a feel of which colleagues they are moving in, whether it's uh, in the upper calyx, middle or the lower calyx. So simulation programs definitely uh, the whole, uh, gives a better uh, orientation for the uh, uh, colleagues who are performing uh, initial RIRS. Very good. So I think uh, you have done very attractive. More than 180 people have watched the program. Still, a uh, lot of people are online. I think uh, it, it's very useful. Whatever I wanted as a surgical technique, you enlightened everything for RIRS. It will be a good record of the YouTube for you. And uh, you. sooner, uh, if you have any good case, interesting feature, again, we will come back to you. Thank yes, you sir. so much, Ravijan. Thank you very Thank much. You, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you.